Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Gladys McCormick, and I'm the Jay and Debbie Moskowitz Endowed Chair in Mexico-U.S. Relations at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. I'm also a non-resident senior associate with the Americas program at CSIS. Um, thank you for joining us today for a conversation on rethinking security on the road to the 2022 Summit of the Americas. Before we formally begin, uh, let's just take care of some of the logistics. Uh, this event will take approximately 60 minutes. Um, following the panelists' remarks and a moderated discussion, we will field questions from the audience. Um, and we ask our audience to please submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live Questions bottom on the event web page. Today, we will have simultaneous interpretation. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, please click on the globe button that says interpretation and then select the language you wish to listen in. Ahora, para nuestra audiencia hispanohablante, tendremos interpretación simultánea para la audiencia hispanohablante. Para escuchar el evento en español, por favor, haga clic sobre el icono del globo que encuentra en su pantalla y que dice interpre Interpretation y elija Español. Again, good morning. So major security issues in the Americas, such as drug finance, criminal networks, interference from external actors, and the spread of disinformation do not respect national boundaries and have a direct impact on political stability, corruption, and migration in the region. The 2022 Summit of the Americas in the United States provides a unique opportunity to consider a more comprehensive view of security that goes well beyond um, uh, protecting borders and embraces human security concerns as well. In anticipation of the 2022 Summit of the Americas, government actors, the private sector, and civil society should highlight the various traditional and non-traditional threats facing the Western Hemisphere to create a concrete prioritized agenda at the summit. Security is without a doubt one of the top priorities in the hemisphere. Today, we have a distinguished panel of speakers. They will share their insights on the transnational security issues currently facing the region and will provide specific recommendations for decision makers to leverage the 22 at the 2022 summit as a platform to strengthen regional cooperation on security matters. Our first panelist is Ms. Nuria Espash, former Minister of Defense of Peru from 2020 to 2021. Ms. Espach has been a public in the public service since 1997 and has served in various capacities in the Peruvian government before serving as Minister of Defense from 2020 to 2021. She is the first woman to serve as Minister of Defense in Peru, and she's an expert on defense cooperation and public administration. Nuria, thank you so much for joining us. Our second panelist is Ms. Alexandra Winkler, a non-resident senior associate with the Americas program. Ms. Winkler previously served as deputy major, mayor of El Atillo, one of the five municipalities of Caracas, Venezuela. She has over 10 years experience in both the public and private sectors in areas such as strategic communications and organizational development. Alexandra, thank you for joining us today. Our third panelist today is Mr. Alejandro Ope, a security consultant and partner at GEA Grupo de Economistas y Asociados. Mr. Ope has nearly 30 years of experience in defense policy and public service in the Mexican government. He is a subject matter expert on issues of defense policy, bilateral and multilateral security cooperation and civilian intelligence. Alejandro, thank you for joining us today. Our panelists today will frame the conversation by assessing the impacts of migration, transnational criminal organizations, COVID-19, and the political instability on security in the hemisphere. They will offer specific recommendations for decision makers as they prepare for the 2022 Summit of the, Americ of the Americas. Nuria, over to you. Thank you so much, Gladys, for the introduction um, and CSIS for the invitation. It's also been a pleasure to meet the panelists this morning. Okay, in the first place, what I want to do is uh, mention what, we're what we mean when we talk about security. 
which is defined as a situation in which sovereignty, uh, independence, and territorial integrity is guaranteed. That's the definition in the Peruvian constitution. And it's also a constitutional state, and security, uh, of course, includes human security. I think that this issue is very, very important because we have to understand in this moment that the center of our concern has to be people. And especially uh, those most, the most vulnerable people uh, at this particular time, not only in some countries within the region, uh, as we had mentioned earlier in this webinar, uh, we are talking about uh, themes that are, that are transnational. The problems of one affect the, uh, others uh, a little um, to, to uh, think about not just uh, referring specifically to Argentina or Canada, for example. Uh, we have to think about America, uh, Latin America, or excuse me, uh, the continent, America as a whole, uh, as an identity where what we need to do is protect people, especially the most vulnerable, who face uh, crime and, prob and security problems uh, that are multifaceted, uh, that, that cover various dimensions and are also um, multi-causal. That is to say, there's not much clarity or uh, precision and we also have to, so we have to be very exact. They depend a lot where we are in the area uh, or in the continent. Uh, and we also today, uh, as we mentioned, at a time uh, that where the world is becoming more globalized, we have to deal with interdependence and mutual vulnerability. We also have a, situ a situation with m uh, multiple actors. There's a web of interrelationships on the continent. And finally, we obviously have social issues uh, that are part of us. And we believe uh, that these, the many challenges we have to face in the continent um, all, are, all feed into uh, security and defense. In general, I believe that this is an opportunity to prepare, as the title of this webinar says, the, the path towards the summit of the Americas in 2022. I believe that having a little more uh, clarity about the threats that we have uh, facing the people, sovereignty, territorial integrity, etc., uh, we also have to think about how to make our continent, uh, how to remake our continent after the pandemic that we're still suffering under, and what to do in the continent uh, as a result of the high levels of interdependence uh, and transnational crime, drugs, etc., and. And I don't want to go much further because there are some very specific questions about this. So I'll pass it back to Gladys. All right, so we next go with Alexandra. Alexandra, I think we're having a little bit of problems with the audio. Not yet. I, th I think you should be good. Okay, Alexandra, can you try again? Still, sorry, still can't. No. Um, Alexandra, why don't we ask you to sort of step in and come back in? And in the meantime, I'm going to cede the floor to Alejandro. Alejandro, can you continue? Sure, I can continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, CSIS. Thank you very much to all the organizers that made this, this event possible. Thank you very much to my co-panelists. Co and thank you very much to everyone connecting to see this webinar. Um, let me just try to briefly uh, describe what has changed since the last Summit of the Americas in, in, in 2018 in very, very broad brushes. Um, one, and I think it's, it's a fundamental issue, is that you, what you have had in recent years and as, is a broad decline of uh, US influence in Latin America. That is, uh, that was already the case since this, probably since the start, uh, the commodity booms of the first decade of the century and uh, the rise of, of China as a trade partner of uh, many Latin American countries. Uh, but uh, probably that the nativist and um, inward looking policies of the Trump administration probably accelerated that process. 
and um, what uh, and what you have, and at the same time, Latin American uh, Latin American policy also became much more inward looking for for a number of reasons. Uh, so what you have is probably far less. The U.S. has far less instruments to um, influence uh, the policy and po the politics of Latin America than it had had in quite a long time. I think that that is one issue that should be on the table. Second issue that is, I think it's on a, a, a broad trend is you have across the region, and this is not only Latin America, but also I would also point out to the, the case of the, of the US, you have an erosion of the democratic practices and values and norms. Um, you have uh, 20 years ago when the, the, the Summit of America's process started almost a bit more than 20 years ago, this uh, what you you were still riding riding a democratic wave in the, in, in in the continent. Um, there was uh, there was a, there were relatively close institutional uh, similarities across across the region, um, and you had a, you and you had more or less of a commitment to democratic institutions. That is no longer the case. Uh, I think what, what you have seen is the rise of extremist pol politics uh, across the region. You are seeing um, the rise of uh, non-establishment uh, of non-establishment politics across the region, and the center is not holding. Even even right now, we're seeing in, in, in Chile, for instance, uh, where you're seeing a super polarized election in the country that was the uh, the the epitome of, uh, of a stable, a stable democratic politics in, in, in Latin America. So this is, this is something that is happening across, across, across the region. You have a rise of uh, populism, whatever that may, may uh, signify in, in different countries, but that is, I think, something that is a major trend in terms of analyzing the security outlook uh, in the Americas. And thirdly, the security outlook itself has changed. Um, Drug markets have changed. Um, I think the vol in both in terms of volume and value, drug drug trade is no longer a north south, no longer has a a, a simple north south dimension. Um, it's no longer just Colombians sending or Peruvians and Colombians sending cocaine to the U.S. through Central America and Mexico, uh, or the Caribbean. That is no longer what the, that no longer describes. The drug, the drug trade uh, properly. Uh, it is a much more complicated issue. There is south south uh, drug. There is a south south drug trade. Uh, Brazil has risen to be a major consumer market for cocaine, for instance. Um, Mexico has is following up. Um, you have the rise of synthetic drugs, uh, meth, uh, fentanyl. Uh, you have uh, uh, exports to extra region to uh, other regions to europe to asia so this is it is becoming much more comp it's it is becoming much a much more complex picture in terms of, of the drug market um also in terms of immigration it's i think it's, uh, the issue of uh, of immigration is no longer uh hordes of people trying to make it to the u.s of latin americans trying to to make it all, all the way to the u.s you you have also uh Intra intra Latin American uh, migration and refugee flows that are pretty significant. In the case of Venezuela, is is pretty significant in that in that regard. Um, you have as as a, as a source of, of, of immigrants, you have a ex, a lot of extra regional ex, extra regional uh, immigration coming to the region and into the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has become increasingly, I mean, the, the immigration politics in the U.S. have become increasingly toxic, um, increasingly toxic. So it's much more difficult to reach some, to, to make this a, a, a part of a broad multilateral multilateral uh, agenda. And also you also, you not only have nativist, the rise of nativist politics in the, in the U.S., but also in many Latin American countries. Um, again, I would point to the case of Chile right now. The 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 rising star of the process as a uh, the the the, the, the right wing candidate is running on an anti immigration anti immigration uh, plank. So this is <coughs> a corporate. I think the uh, you the challenges that we faced twenty years ago or even four years ago have significantly changed. 
um, I think we have you have a much more um, significant presence of extra regional uh, actors, particularly Russia and China. Um, you have uh, the rise of, uh, I mean, cyber or uh, cyber politics, the the use of of, uh, of uh, social media and uh, and uh, uh, and cyber attacks as a tool of policy. That was that was kind of the the, the case four years ago, but it has that that I think has, that has become much more accentuated over the past four years. So I'm going to stop my my initial remarks here, but I think those are the three major issues. No, the decline of U.S. influence in Latin America. Uh, an erosion of democratic uh, values and processes, and uh, a change, significantly change security outlook. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, Alexandra, we're going to see if it works with the audio now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Sorry for thank the technical you. difficulties. We got it through. So first of all, thank you, CSIS and the Americas program for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I think we can all agree, and a little bit of what I was able to hear from Alejandro and Nuria, that, you know, Latin America is facing, you know, a really chronic security crisis and that there are warning signs that the region's high rates of criminal violence and vulnerability will continue rising if nothing really gets done. And without going country by country, you know, across the board, you know, the regional environment is just extremely critical. Chile has suffered from constant social unrest. Um, there are worsening levels of violence in the Northern Triangle resulted out of this prolonged migration in the U.S.-Mexico border. Nicaragua continues to suffer under the brutal and corrupt Ortega regime. This week, we just saw on Monday how Cuban activists were forcibly trapped inside their homes because they wanted to go and protest and the government did not let them. Um, the hopes for democracy and stability in the region are hanging by a thread depending on what the Colombian elections will look like. And you know, you have current presidents such as Andrés Manuel López Obrador and Alberto Fernández in Argentina who are on these anti-neoliberal detours and focus on confronting centralist ideas. And of course, you can't forget the 22-year human disaster that is Venezuela, which just continues to die in spiral and with no easy way out. So I think the biggest conclusion we can give to this part of the panel is that, you know, certainly the dynamics of Latin America are quite complex and the evolution of societies over the years have been quite uneven. But the predominant trend that I am seeing right now is that across the board, there is a rise of authoritarian and anti-democratic and non-inclusive socialist political systems, which just create more insecurity in our region because they form economies which are characterized by small groups of wealthy elites and large segments of marginalized populations because they manipulate judicial systems that ignore rule of law, that reward impunity, and that make corruption a norm. And they just cultivate unsafe environments, making it not easy to live or survive for anyone in the region. And the net effect is that Latin America is the most violent and economically unequal region in the world, and with one of the biggest migration crises in modern history. So there is so much at stake in these transnational security issues. And I'm sure that all of those variables and all of those considerations will be accounted for within the Summit of the Americas. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day as Professor Craig Dean from the National Defense University would always say, you know, US prestige and credibility and the credibility of the free world is also at stake. It's also on the line because everyone is looking at the way the US and the free world responds to deal with these crises in Latin America. And that includes the Chinese, the Russians and any other foreign actors. So I think political will is being tested more than ever. And let's just hope that the world is finally ready to pay more attention to Latin America as it's needed and just take more action and do the right thing. Thank you, Alexandra, that was great. Um, so now we're gonna move into sort of the conversation part. Um, and I wanna actually sort of push back at the three of you um, to get you to sort of think of what would be the top three security concerns facing decision makers in the region um, ahead of the 2022 Summit of the Americas. In other words, uh, the three of you have put a number of issues on the table, um, but if you were to advise um, in terms of ranking that order, which would you consider to be the top three issues that uh, individuals have to actually discuss uh, because it's clear that securing the hemisphere is gonna require a comprehensive and multilateral response. Nuria, what do you identify as the top three concerns? Thank you, Gladys. Well, I think that the uh, security and defense threats that 
I think that the concerns and security threats that were established in the Declaration of Bridgetown in 2002 and the Declaration of the Security of the Americas in Mexico haven't changed a lot. That is, the problems of drug trafficking and arms trafficking, etc., transnational organized crime, corruption, uh, and also the, the de 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 deterioration of the environment and natural disasters. But I think that this list hasn't changed much in recent years. But something that uh, Anna, Alexandra mentioned on the panel just now is that I believe that dem democracy is uh, under, sea, under attack throughout the region. And this is a cross-country issue of many countries. It's a problem in Nicaragua or uh, this, the situation that just happened in Peru. I think it's an issue that has to do with a range of conditions on the continent that have to be carried out in a conscientious uh, and, and, and direct way, because uh, especially in the summit next year. It's not a matter of chance that we are living in such a difficult situation in the region where polarization is effectively uh, creating a situation in which we don't recognize the possibility of dialogue in, in the other side. That is to say, now if you think differently, you have been eliminated from any negotiating table uh, and or conversations. So I think that we have to, in English, go back to basics. We, we, do, we have to carry out the, the basic steps. Uh, we have to take the first uh, conversation, which is uh, how to have a democratic state in the Americas, because I believe that that's the cornerstone on which any discussion about security on the continent uh, is sustained. Okay, thank you. Um, so Nudia is very much sort of putting this issue of sort of go, kind of going back to the basics in terms of thinking about sort of what, what is sort of undergirding uh, democracy and the weakening and the threats to democracy that we've seen um, throughout the region. Alejandro, what would you identify as the top three concerns that are facing decision makers? I agree with Nudia. I think, I think it's the biggest concern right now is the erosion of the, of the, the democratic institutions across the, the hemisphere. Uh, because that is creating the rise of uh, opaque, uh, opaque, uh, mostly incompetent, uh, mostly uh, and extremely corrupt autocracies, um, or or would be auto, auto autocracies. Um, Venezuela is the extreme case, of course, but there are others. I mean, Bolsonaro is in Brazil is one one potential example. Even AMLO in Mexico is another is another potential example. Um, you are that is that could have significant ramifications in terms of how countries deal and uh, cooperate with each other and how countries deal with uh, common security threats going forward. Um, because uh, you are not not going to have a common democratic uh, uh, base of, of understanding across the region. That is, I think, that is something what, that is no longer there. Um, secondly. Um, I think there is a non-trivial risk of implosion in uh, of major social unrest in several countries, um, and even even something uh, potentially approaching civil war conditions, and maybe in Venezuela, which potential ramifications in Cuba. Um, you can, and that that could really be extremely stabilizing for the region i don't know how what the, the odds are of that of that uh, outcome particularly in the negotiations between the opposition and the government of the, the Maduro government are not going uh, are not going very well um thirdly uh, I, I would point out the you have a an increasing uh, blurring of the line between state actors and criminal actors in many in many parts of the region. Um, again, Venezuela extreme case, but certainly not the only one. Um, you, what you have in 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 many cases, what you have is the state, uh, the arm, the uh, armed forces uh, becoming a an integral part of uh, public uh, of the response for public safety and crime fighting uh, uh, responses. Um, and uh, that is putting the that is politicizing the armed forces. That is creating a um, that is, that is creating a uh, backlash against civilian control over the armed forces. 
um, that is creating also the risk for at the integrity for the, the integrity of armed forces in many countries are probably at risk. Um, and again, that is that that can be extremely destabilizing, uh, particularly if in in an, in in an era where or in in an environment where you have fewer democratic and civilian controls over the security apparatus. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. Um, so in other words, uh, it's sort of the erosion of democracy and then from there we kind of get this sort of, you know, uh, cascading effect of the civil implosion, civil unrest, um, and then sort of the blurry line between organized crime and um, essentially government agencies, right, institutions, so the capturing of the state. Um, Alexandra, how about you? How would you yeah, identify the top absolutely three? absolutely agree with the erosion of democracy. I mean, there's a, there's a rising number of regional political actors who are embracing ideolog ideological positions who are opposed to open political systems, democracy, free markets, you name it, that's number one. I think number two is the presence of transnational criminal organizations and you know who look to exploit weak levels of governance across the majority of countries in Latin America and to destabilize the region. We see that most with that triangle of terror or the troika of tyranny as John Bolton would say, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. And I think the best example of this presence is Hezbollah considered a terrorist organization by 61 countries around the world, but there are operatives leaving freely in Venezuela under the protection of the Maduro regime, involved in arms trafficking, drug trafficking, and money laundering in order to finance terror. And I think the third one, Gladys, is presence of extra regional actors. And I, and I really want to make emphasis on this one because I feel like many countries have filled the vacuum created by the United States due to its historical destruction to attend national security issues on the other side of the war, instead of maybe paying a little bit more attention to the threats on this side of the hemisphere. And we openly see that with China. We see that with Russia. We see that with Iran. We see that with Turkey, which provide, all of them provide varying degrees of financial, diplomatic, military, cyber warfare, intelligence support to all US adver adversaries in the region. So I do think that presence of extra regional actors should also be taken into consideration. Okay, so then that brings us to four kind of key points on the list, right? So aside from the ones that I mentioned after Alejandro, um, what Alexander's really sort of put on the table is these extra legal actors, including other nation states that are making major incursions, both politically and financially, into the region. Um, all right, so I'm going to push push um, and go in a slightly different direction to sort of think about the fact that the three of you have a little bit of a clear consensus in terms of what the menu of discussion should be for these decision makers, right? So what happens when you sort of interject the fact that these are transnational security concerns and interject two other lines of questioning. One of them is migration, the flows of people. And then the other one are the effects, the long-term effects of COVID-19 um, and how that is, in and of itself is gonna have ripple effects into security. So how does your uh, answer change um, if you sort of add in migration and COVID-19 to the mix? Um, and then how do you sort of see governments and civil society coming to a, together to address these transnational concerns? Uh, Nuria? Effectively, I believe that in order to summarize everything that's been said um, about the, the challenges that we're facing with respect to foreign people, um, of democracy under attack, etc., are the results of the pandemic and migration that, that we've been, well, that is ongoing in Latin America. And Peru is one of the countries that has received uh, some of the most migrants along with Colombia from Venezuela. This is an issue that we live day by day here in my country. But I think that this is definitely a measure to put onto the menu for discussion uh, what will be the long-term effects of these, uh, of these trends, because again, this is an issue that uh, people coming from Venezuela and ending up in Peru or Chile or wherever they end up, uh, if this is not a topic of regional discussion, it needs to be answered regionally because in some countries, and we already have a, a, health, a health challenge in all of them, uh, we, have, we have a health pro problem on migration. For example, in particular, it's, it's noted that, the pro that uh, it's a problem of a country and not as a regional problem. And I believe that this is an issue we have to face collectively. And a few days ago, 
uh, I heard that around 5 million Venezuelans have left their country. This also probably means a change in the democratic matrix of Venezuela. That mobilization means 5 million people have left and will no longer vote in their country. And who will no longer participate in politics in their country. And that also has an impact on the region in general and how we're looking at situations. And re regarding the pandemic, I believe that uh, we need to not only look at it as a threat um, well, well, a reality at this time, uh, but as a threat in the future, because we know that it is simply one of several that we are going to have due to climate change and, and, and other factors. I believe that it's also an opportunity to, uh, to see um, what we can do or what we have to fix with the function, with a logistical function, uh, to rethink the function of security forces in Latin America, because I believe that in particular uh, during the pandemic, the role that both the police and the armed forces played, uh, the armed forces in each country have been key to successfully dealing with, well, with different success levels, uh, the effects of the pandemic. So I, I think that all these issues, effectively migration and the pandemic, have to be part of a discussion at the summit. But they also play a role in other collective issues, which is a bit of the question that Gladys posed about what to do about this. Uh, because this problem does not uh, care for borders. This is a problem that crosses borders. I, I was in Europe and they were talking about Argentina while referring to Canada. Uh, I think it's evident that the, the interconnectivity of the whole continent and and it's very important to see this as a package issue, not a national issue. Um, I think that we have to to to, uh, to do that to pass the level uh, to rise to the level of discussion on how to collectively face these regional challenges. Alejandro, estás en mute. I think there are these two issues that you that you um, listed. Um, my immigration migration flows and the pandemic and the COVID-19 COVID pandemic have a common thread, which is that both have given rise to nativists uh, or have driven um, or, or accelerated the, uh, the drive towards nativist politics. Uh, they have made uh, economic integration, which was one of the drivers of the initial some of the Americas process uh, 20 years ago, have turned back the clock in, 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 in many directions. Now, moving across the region has become much more difficult. Um, moving legally across the region has become much more difficult. Um, trade flows have been disrupted because of, because of the pandemic. Trade integration has been disrupted because of the pandemic. And also because in, in now immigration has... Uh, the control of immigration flows have be, has become a major issue of concern in many countries where it was not an issue. And the reason, I mean, immigration was a U.S.-Mexico thing or a U.S.-Central America thing. I, now it's much more complicated. Uh, now a lot of countries across the region have become uh, destination for 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 immigrants. Uh, countries that were not major sources of, uh, of immigrants have become now uh, major uh, ma major uh, players in, in this issue, um, and uh, so th so th so the pattern the pattern is much more complicated than what we understood 20 years ago. But more important, I think, what the past two years have proven is that we don't have good multilateral instruments to deal with this type of challenges. Um, the OAS is, if not dead, more uh, is, uh, is not dead, it's dying, and uh, it is no longer a, an adequate form to deal with many of these of this, uh, this challenges. Um, some of the intra-regional uh, intra -regional, uh, trade mechanisms have, uh, again, if not uh, died, are probably in the, the deathbeds, I'm thinking Mercosur, I'm thinking um, CELAC, I'm, I'm thinking other, those other uh, some of the, some of the, the group of Lima, um, all those instruments are no longer there in, in many ways. So 
you have you have this challenge, this rising challenges that are pushing that are pushing countries in in a more into a more inward, more nativist direction, and you don't have a countervailing influence from the outside, and you don't have you don't have instruments from the outside. So this poses, I think, this should lead to a, a rethinking of the multilateral uh, Pan American uh, Inter American. Uh, institutional framework. Uh, I think it means no longer responsive to the new challenges. Thank you, Alejandro. Alexandra? Gladys, I think like Nuria and Alejandro said, like I have learned that the majority of these security issues need to have this collective and multilateral approach, you know, tackled through both regional and transnational coordination. But I do feel that Sometimes we forget that local authorities exist and that they have such an important role in building safer environments for their constituents within their cities. Like based on my experience as deputy mayor, you know, local authorities are on the front line. They're closest to the people they serve. They're working hand in hand with civil society and NGOs, and they are responsible for creating security strategies that will improve their quality of life. So maybe I'd like to offer three recommendations to those specific local governments. And I can think of one, you know, making sure that security is a priority in your city's government plan. And, and for example, in El Atillo, security was our constituents' most important concern. We had the political will to make it transversal, to make it that overarching policy that would influence any other program, whether it be social, economical, urban, no matter what we were launching, doing, or inaugurating, you know, all projects created benefits in security. And every department embraced security as their goal. And we would be transparent about our results. We would say how many homicides we would have in a month, how many people were kidnapped in a month. And that would help us gain full support from all sectors, private sector, NGOs, communities, media, academia, you name it. I think a second recommendation would be we all have to do our part in improving trust in local police. I was reading last night Galut's 2021 Law and Order Index and 71% of adults worldwide have confidence in their local police. But if you see that number in Latin America, that, that goes to an alarming 49%. And if you see it in Peru, that goes to 46%. And if you see that in Venezuela, that goes to 28%. It gets even worse. Local authorities must reestablish the bond between police and community. And we just have to do everything it takes to humanize our police forces more, to rebuild those institutions, and make sure that they have enough investment and training. And I think my last recommendation would be you know, we have to start investing more time and resources in training communities to self-organize for prevention and security response. This means implementing community policing programs such as, you know, citizen watch networks or crime report stations. It's inviting um, communities to participate in police oversight and accountability. It's creating school prevention programs. We had a ton of those in Inatillo. It's promoting fundraisers to even install better lighting or cameras right next to your community. So. I feel like an organized community or neighborhood can be the police's most important asset in order to address any security situation and improve people's general perception about living safer in their communities as well. So, Thank you, Alexandra. Um, so let me, um, I wanna actually sort of pick up on a point that Nuria brought at the beginning and then Alexandra has actually emphasized, uh, which is sort of the role and the changing role of using the military as police. Um, so both of you have highlighted how both the police and the military have sort of, especially with COVID-19, um, has dramatically sort of altered some of the relationships that these two entities have with the state or have with civil society. Um, so let's sort of take a slightly deeper dive. And I want to specifically ask Alejandro and Nuria to address these questions. And Alexandra, I'm going to come back to you with a more specific question about Venezuela. Um, so Alejandro and Nuria, um, you know, and uh, Alejandro had briefly mentioned uh, autocracies um, and sort of the capturing of democracy um, and the weakening of democracy that we've seen throughout. Now, let's actually sort of look at that through the lens of what's been going on with uh, the ways in which governments have been using the military for police and how that sort of impacts kind of growing security concerns in the region. Um, and I would sort of use the language of tut uh, tutelary uh, democracies um, that we're sort of seeing this sort of growing trend of the closeness by which the military police and presidents and government figures are collaborating with each other. So Nuria. Would you mind starting us off with this and then we'll go to Alejandro? Thank you. Two things. The first that has to do more with the theme of this question. Um, 
The first thing is that it's an error, in my opinion, absolutely, to make the armed forces adopt a police role. First, for the simple issue of training. Um, because the armed forces train you to fight against an enemy. And the citizens of a country are not the enemies of the armed forces. So that's the, fir that's the first issue. The second uh, idea, of course, has to do with the structure of the armed forces, with taxes. That we are putting up money to train the armed forces and to equip them in a certain way uh, so that in the end, if they go, if they end up going out into the streets to respond to crimes and citizen security, that isn't its job either. It's true, uh, of course, in some countries that the armed forces can help restore public order uh, or internal order where it has been rendered vulnerable by enemy forces in some way. Uh, but definitely citizen security uh, uh, has to do with what Alexandra mentioned a moment ago to say that the management of a country or of interpersonal relationships should not be imposed upon by the military. That's my opinion that I've uh, developed over all these years. I firmly believe that everyone uh, must do the job for which they are trained. But there's an additional issue uh, in what Gladys mentioned about the, this idea of the armed forces as tutelary forces of these countries. And I'm just now doing an investigation into all these issues, and we can see how in Latin America for many years, the armed forces have been effectively considered as a tutelary institution for each country. And then uh, in, in almost, every, almost every situation, what happened was the armed forces took control of the governments uh, in their entirety. Of course, at this moment, uh, it, at, it, it seems, given the level of democracy we have in the region, this might be uh, somewhat unthinkable. But what surprises me the most, and here I'm going to talk about uh, a Peruvian case, since uh, in the last election, we've seen civilians asking the military to intervene. So... Um, of course, now we have the result, and, we have the and I've had the opportunity to talk with many Peruvian military officials about this situation, and they themselves are very surprised at the level of, quote-unquote, I want to put this phrase in quotation marks, the tendency towards golpismo among the civilians. And, and these are civilians who, uh, who don't know how to solve internal problems, disagreements uh, that I mentioned in the beginning. We can't recognize one another and have the ability uh, to put a diff uh, an, a, an idea we disagree with uh, up to the light and resolve that. We can't have to, and that is fundamentally politics. We have to be able to say, uh, please give, give me your position. I'll listen, and afterwards you do the same for me. So this is a, a paradoxical challenge in the sense that uh, it was very common in countries, especially in Latin America, not just not 30 years ago, uh, where the military be came in to save democracies, and yet, nevertheless, there's been a return to these sentiments. Of course, these are uh, just small groups at the moment, but it's worth noting uh, that these groups are beginning to emerge, asking for the intervention of the armed forces um, and an idea of organizing things, putting things in order because they've gotten out of hand. And I think this is part of what I was talking about when it comes to democracy being under attack. And this is also a symptom of us asking the armed forces to participate in uh, civilian work, both in citizen security and obviously participation in the government. Fortunately, and we'll see it a little bit later, but in the Peruvian case, the armed forces from the 1990s uh, to, the 2000, to the early 2000s uh, um, found themselves in a, in, a, in a difficult situation for them after the, and after the departure of President Fujimori, they've learned a lot about their constitutional role, and they are rather firm in the defense of the constitutional order. And that, for me, I believe uh, that, that, that there's a lot to protect and a lot to revive, um, and that on this we have to discuss the role of putting, we have to be putting the armed forces on the agenda and discussing what role they fulfill within countries. Thank you. Alejandro, so I, I should tell you that this question in some ways comes to me, uh, the idea of a tutelary democracy comes to me after the Cienfuegos case uh, with Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, 
in part because it was somewhat surprising to sort of see the proximity between AMLO um, and the military in Mexico. So how does this look like from your vantage point? Well, I think, I mean, the Mexican case is somewhat anomalous in Latin America because we haven't had a coup since the a successful coup since 1920. And we haven't had a uh, an open military insurrection since 1938. So the, the military have, uh, have been a, somewhat non-political, had been a non-political actor until recently, and, um, or a somewhat non-political actor in, uh, until recently. Um, but what you're seeing is they're being called, and I think this is not only a Mexican, uh, a Mexican, the military are being called to uh, carry out many tasks that were previously uh, uh, reserved for civilian institutions partially because of the failure of those civilian institutions. Um, I'm thinking there's, of course, of course, uh, public public security uh, crime and crime, crime fighting, but there's also, I mean, uh, civil defense, um, response to natural disasters, um, even the response to the pandemic to COVID-19. I think most, most countries in the region uh, made use of their, of their, uh, of their military to um, um, enforce to, to enforce lockdowns, to distribute vaccines, uh, to provide medical services. I mean, so the the military being called to to do many things that was not in on in their in there is not in their traditional purview. Um, and this is the thing. I think this is dangerous in many ways, but it's also and this is also something that has to be acknowledged. It tends to be rather popular. I mean, there is uh, the the armed forces for all their flaws tend to have a relatively high approval rating in many countries in the region. Mexico is probably the extreme in that, but but because we haven't had military governments, um, openly military governments, but it is something there that has brought tends to be have brought political and social support, and political actors tend to shy away from confronting fronting and the armed forces tend to have a lot of deference. Civilian politicians don't have a lot of deference for, for uh, people in uniform. Um, but this is the thing is this broad militarization trend, I think the problem is it tends to be self-reinforcing. Um, once you give the military uh, a role, a specific role, then you, the incentives to develop civilian cap capabilities go down. And since you don't have civilian capability, you don't have civilian capabilities, then you have to rely on the military and it becomes a vicious circle. Um, so uh, in, in, in the Mexican, in, in, I mean, the specific, the specific question, why are they, why is AMLO looking at the military? Well, it's a way of bypassing the civilian bureaucracy, which he doesn't trust. Um, it's and it's uh, and if you actually look at the worldview of the Mexican military, particularly the Mexican army, it's not that far away from his the ideological positions of, of, of AMLO. I mean, they see themselves as the people in arms. They see themselves as a force born out of the Mexican Revolution. They see themselves as um, as a tool of social advancement for the masses. So it's not that they see themselves as a nationalist defense, a defender of, of Mexican sovereignty. So it's not that far from where AMLO is ideologically. Um, and uh, for them, I mean, it's a super, I mean, this increasing number of tasks that they're being, they being uh, thrown their way uh, from, you know, public safety to building airports, to building trains, to, you know, distributing vaccines, distributing gasoline, whatever. Um, I mean, it's a way of them of bypassing budgetary controls. They gain, they gain, uh, and that is, I think that's also a broad trend in the region. You have relatively small defense budgets, but you have off-budget income streams going into the military for in, in, in different different ways. And that is also, I think, uh, weakening civilian control uh, across uh, uh, over over the military establishment. Alejandro, I appreciate that. And I think it, it values highlighting the fact that, you know, that relationship between presidents and not just in Mexico, but elsewhere too, with the military is a way to sort of bypass civilian kind of checks and balances. Um, so I want to actually sort of come to one of the questions from our audience members and put Alexandra on the spot. 
Um, so Alexandra, one of the questions that we have here, and I want to actually sort of highlight it that in part because you had mentioned the presence of extra regional actors uh, and you mentioned China as well as a host of others, right? But let's sort of like kind of look at the influence of China in the region. Um, is there any evidence that collaboration in the form of trade agreements and pan-continental law enforcements will improve in the next 20 years given the influence of other extra national actors such as China? Will trade agreements help sort of offset some of that? That could be a possibility, but I think the first thing that we would have to tackle in Venezuela when it comes to China is that we are growing a huge debt, billions of dollars with them because of all the financial and um, all the help that they're giving the Maduro regime at the moment. And I do gladly want to emphasize that, you know, Venezuela continues to be one of the most dangerous countries in the world and the Maduro regime is a threat to the US, it's a threat to the region, and it's a threat to the world. And I do wanna emphasize that because sometimes I feel like different international political actors tend to forget that you know Venezuela and Maduro is a criminal mafia state with senior officials who are linked to organized crime and heavily involved in narcotics. Um, it's, a, it's a regime that shows evident, uh, evidence of kleptocracy. It's a regime that provides safe haven to irregular armed groups such as ELN and FARC. Um, I, just now, Funda Redes it confirmed a couple of months ago that out of the 24 states in Venezuela, 19 had presence of FARC dissidents. And it just continues to benefit from the illicit gold mining um, issue, which is a critical commodity for Maduro to maintain loyalty of the military. There's no other way to say it. So and we can't forget, of course, that the regime is under formal investigation for committing crimes against humanity. So I think it just, it just goes to show how of all these China, Turkey, Iran, Russia are just supporting that crime hub. And because Maduro has found a way to make crime and, and, and violence a policy of his state to maintain control and repression across the population. And just before I end, I, I do want to highlight this, this, this crazy figure I saw in the last couple of days. You know, despite the pandemic, the Venezuelan Violence Observatory registered over 11,000 homicides through 2020. And someone told me, oh, well, that's lower. That means that it's around 45, the rate of 45 per 100,000 citizens. And yes, that could be lower due to COVID-19, due to quarantine. But for the first time in the country's history last year, there were more homicides by security forces than by criminals. That just goes to show that the violence by state actors have just been on the rise since 2016. And that now for the entire nation, for every 100 homicides that were perpetrated by criminals, 101 homicides were attributed to the country's security forces. So that just goes to show that all of these regional actors are just supporting that ecosystem and it's not making things better. Thank you, Alexandra. And you actually answered one of the other questions that was put in the chat, uh, which is regarding sort of the influence of guerrilla groups, um, specifically those coming from Colombia with the FARC and the ELN. Um, so let's talk, uh, one of the questions that was put in the chat, which is wonderful, is um, this issue of presidential elections. Um, Alejandro touched on the fact that we're having upcoming presidential elections in Chile. Um, Nuria coming from Peru is very familiar with presidential elections given the fact that they've had five different presidents in five years. So with all these sort of upcoming, and I'm not saying hopefully this one will stick, but with other countries sort of having presidential elections on their radar, um, do you see any of these security concerns evolving or changing as a result of those presidential elections? Um, Nuria, I start with you and then I go to Alejandro. I think that uh, this has been commented on uh, in the discussion about the attack on democracy and that the entire region has to be very careful Everyone must be very attentive to what is happening in each of these elections because what I believe is happening uh, in the ma majority of these is that we are seeing the disappearance of the mobilized center in politics and that we're seeing support of these people at extremes. And we have to reflect about the fact uh, that these extremes are representing the people. And I think this is an issue that we need to discuss within the context of the region and ask this question um, about what's happening in the democracies in our continent, right? What's happening with democracy that makes people feel more identified with the extremes, uh, that people don't have the willingness to bring their points of view closer together? Um, 
And when one wins, that we are immediately at the front of the discussion. I think that in this moment, and by the way, there are several things that have been said that we're going to have to think about uh, on uh, uh, in a future agenda. Um, that after leaving the p- pandemic, for instance, we're going to have 35 million more million more poor people in our region, in our continent, uh, to which we must already add the 186 million we had a couple of years ago. And this is the, uh, some some data from uh, Cepal. So. I think that democracy has to respond to these people. It has to respond to the economies that these people participate in. And we have an important challenge, I think, when it comes to security of knowing what will happen when uh, the pandemic is over and when uh, economies begin, when people affect not only uh, affected in the in informal economy, eventually move into illegal economies. And I think this becomes a public problem, a security problem that we're going to have to face in the short term. And I know that uh, watching our elections um, that are happening uh, soon in in Chile and others, uh, we have to be th- we have to ask ourselves what's happening to the citizens each time when they feel less represented by more moderate opinions and try to bring agreements uh, into this discussion that bring us closer to long-term public policies and intergenerational agreements uh, that mean uh, that let us make uh, better public policy. I think that this is lacking at the moment in this discussion. Um, it's I sometimes feel that we're building the second floor and we've not even finished the first floors, uh, that we're discussi- discussing elevated and sophisticated issues when a major problem is occurring in our societies at the moment. And 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 that this inability to agree on these issues, I think that in the long term, this will happen to us a lot more and we are going to have to face it eventually. Alejandro, how about you? Um, I think things will get worse before they get better, to be frank. Uh, I think the this populist wave that that, that is uh, that is uh, going through the region has yet to burn itself out. Um, I think many things could go wrong over the next two or three years. Uh, I think many dominoes are still have yet to fall. I think Colombia could be the next one. Chile could be the next could be the, the immediate one of, of, you know, of extremist politician uh, gaining national power. Um, Colombia could be the next one. Um, it, I think I don't think we're going to see a re- anytime soon a return to consensus-based, centrist, um, market-friendly policies um, in in the region. I think we're going to go back to that consensus anytime soon. I think we're still we we're in for a rough ride. I um, think the elections in Brazil next year are going to be extremely polarized, for instance. Um, the elections in Mexico in 2024 are likely to be equally polarizing. Um, so uh, I, I don't see, uh, I frankly don't see uh, yet a return to more, uh, quote unquote, to more centrist consensus building type of type type of politics. And that will certainly uh, impact negatively the, the security outlook for the region. Okay, Alexandra, we have one minute left. How would you finish it up with the election? I mean, I feel like for the elections or for any decision maker uh, who's preparing for the 2022 Summit of Americas, which is the reason why we're here today, I think I would just give them the recommendation that don't forget that democracy is at stake mm-hmm. and that geopoli- geopolitics are at play in this part of the world. And those geopolitics are serious, they're troublesome, they will not disappear if you neglect them, and they dedicate required time, attention, and investment sooner rather than later. So a security solution that does not address geopolitical power dynamics in Latin America will most likely not be a sustainable one. That'd be my recommendation. (laughs) Okay, so I think we're kind of coming up to time. Um, So I wanna uh, just say that we could have continued talking for a long time because there's so much on the table. Um, So I wanna extend my heartfelt uh, appreciation to our three speakers, um, to Alexandra, to Nuria and to Alejandro for their generous comments today.
um, and then thank uh, our audience uh, participants for attending and staying with us while we had this conversation. And hopefully we've managed to provide some guidance to those folks who sort of go into the Summit, summit of the Americas in 2022. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>